in the Word of God to Colossians, the third chapter of Colossians. Keep in mind that this is a place where the Apostle had never been. The Lycus Valley section. The character, I'd like to speak tonight on the character of an eagle versus the reputation of a man. The character of an eagle versus the reputation of a man or men. Stand with me and we'll read the word of God together. Starting at verse 10. And have put, put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge. Now notice that. And have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now this is extremely interesting because the words put on and the words knowledge and image are all vital. Verse 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. But Christ is all and in all. Alright, so that tells you where Christ is all in all. Simply, when we put on the new man, and when we put on the new man, we're renewed in knowledge after the image of Jesus Christ. Now verse 12. Here it is again. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, in forgiving one another. And if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all things, and here it is again, put on charity. So far we have three put-ons and, and no put-offs. But uh, anyway, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. doesn't even say sing with the right tune, but it said sing with grace. Boy, a lot of people would sing with grace. And if they'd work as hard singing with grace as they do <laughs> to be on the right tune, boy, it would sound good to Jesus. <laughs> All right. Now then, verse 17. And whatsoever you do in word are in deed, do all in the name of of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Verse 23, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily with everything that's in you as to the Lord and not unto men. Father, bless this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The character of an eagle versus the reputation of a man. The several things that man wants in his life 
and they are normal things but there's one thing that God wants and that's his people to ha have and experience his character the average individual does everything they can to defend their reputation to prove their character if you don't believe it let somebody call you tomorrow that you like and call you names and you never expected they'd do that to you and they literally call you names and make accusation we'll see how much you want to defend your reputation and you're going to be quick to tell them it isn't true and the moment you defend your reputation with man you lose the quality of your character toward God Philippians 2 he made of himself no reputation and remember reputation is what men think we are and character is what God knows I am all right so what would it take to make you prove you have a good reputation character and what is character character is portrayed in the word of God like the life of an eagle if an individual seeks to have a reputation then they'll always be living conscientious of what men expect from them from the good of the tree of knowledge but if they live with an attitude of character toward God they'll live in the expectation of what grace can do to their reputation in the eyes of their own self-image by now I hope you're thinking all right in the word of God in the book of Job the 39th chapter and the 28th verse the word of God says that the eagle makes her nest on the rock and the 29th verse says that the eagle seeketh her prey and her eyes behold the prey from afar off but in verse 30 the word of God says where the slain is is she where the slain are is she now notice that carefully that's the eagle the eagle makes her nest on the rock she has a whole nest and the word of God says she abideth on the rock and from her position on the rock she beholds her prey from afar off and her eyes behold her prey from way above where they are and wherever slain the slain are is she wherever there is death wherever there is absolute death there is she because she represents the character of life now my humility is regulated and reveal by my attitude toward where I am in God's plan for example the word of God says in Matthew 21 13 the humble shall be exalted my position in God's ministry is revealed by where I'm at in God's character 
All right, Luke nine forty eight. He that is least among you shall be the greatest. Or Mark ten thirty, the last shall be first. And when we take our position in the character as the slain, then the eagle reveals the character of the life that is from above. So the Word of God beautifully teaches that in the humility of being slain comes the character of resurrection ascended power. For example, Moses in Numbers 12.3 the great leader is the meekest man of the earth. His meekness Reveal the position of his authority. The meeker he was, the more authority he had in the character of God. Now his reputation was not very good with Miriam at times and Aaron and with the children of Israel when they were murmuring against him for bringing them out to suffer need in the wilderness. His reputation was that he brought them out into a serious situation without help. And they wanted to stone him in Exodus 17. But he turned to the Lord and his meekness revealed his authority. His willingness to have no reputation revealed the character of his leadership in the Godship of his sonship and in the sonship of his everlasting friendship with God came his ability to depend on God's ability to reveal his own character. Now, when Paul said in Ephesians 3.8 that he was less than the least, that revealed the authority of his ministry. When he said, The Lord Jesus came into the world to save sinners in whom I'm chief, in 1 Timothy 1 and 15, that revealed where his authority was at. He that is least among you shall be greatest, and the last shall be first. And the Lord Jesus said, He feels that he's the chief of sinners, he's less than the least, and based upon that humility, I exalt him in the prop, promise of power, in the priority of my purpose. So there Paul had great exaltation in the character of Christ. And when Peter in 2 Peter 3, 14 through 16 recommended Paul's ministry and Paul's teaching above his own and after his beautiful principle at Pentecost Peter began to take on the character of God and no longer tried to keep his reputation as he had in Matthew 26, 71 with the, when he denied Christ three times. There he was trying to keep his reputation. But now he readily reveals the quality of his new life in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the character of his own conviction toward others. He esteemed them greater in Philippians 2, 3 and submitted to them in Ephesians 5.21. Now, it's interesting what the Word of God so beautifully and clearly teaches. For example, in Psalm 125.3, the rod of the wicked shall not rest on the lot of the righteous. Now, think of that. The authority of the wicked, and that's what rod means, shall not rest on the lot of the, the righteous. What is the lot of the righteous? The lot of the righteous is simply the authority of the character of Jesus Christ. But the, the rod or the authority that disease has, the authority that guilt has, the authority that fear has, the authority that sin has and the authority that lust has and the authority that greed has and the authority that the security system built in man's normal natural nature has cannot rest on the law of the righteousness because the character of Jesus Christ repudiates that rod and rebukes that authority and leaves man as an eagle flying above and seeing his prey afar off beholding it with his eyes and his prey is way below him and he's living far above the victim that would try to 
take him over. It's an amazing thing what Job 20 verse 16 says. Job 20 verse 16 says, He sucks the poison of the asp. And the viper's tongue shall slay him. Now the the individual that's not walking in the character of Jesus Christ's life from above sucks the poison from the asp. He's always sucking in poison. Right from the devil's tongue. That's Job 20 verse 16 in your Bible. I hope you're getting all these obscure verses tonight. And then the Word of God says, the wicked or the the tongue of the viper shall slay him. And the eagle, in Job 39, 30, is not there. Because listen, the devil did the killing, not Calvary. When I'm dead with Christ, the eagle is there. But when I'm dead because of a rebellion and disobedience in sin, the demons are there. I either either accept Christ's death and go up with the eagle and mount wings as eagles in Isaiah 40, 31, or I accept the effects of my sin in the devil's program to destroy me and I live in death. So the authority of the wicked cannot rest on the lot of the righteous. What is the lot of the righteous? The lot of the righteous is the throne of God. We have inherited a lot and that lot is the throne. You say, how do you prove that in the scriptures? You know it, if I remind you quickly in this uh, sensitivity to truth. But you hath he quickened together with him and seated you together in heavenly places in Ephesians 2, 5 and 6 who is rich in mercy in Ephesians 2.4. So we've been quickened on a throne and that throne is our lot. We have inherited a finished work throne. We have inherited a fellowship in a family where the Father of all mercies is our Father in 2 Corinthians 1.3 and our elder brother is the God of all love in 1 John 4.8 and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of all grace in Hebrews 10.29 and the corporate body is the fullness of all of that expressed in Colossians 2.9 and we have inherited that throne as our lot and that throne has promoted us as kings in Revelation 1.3 6 and priests in Revelation 1 6 and we're part of his body in Ephesians 1 23 and that's our lot now the the rod of the wicked in 1 25 3 of Psalms has no authority in the lot of the righteous why because like an eagle we behold our victim way below and our eyes behold it afar off we're not having friendship with it we're not buddy buddy with it We're not taking the serpent's tongue and saying a little closer, a little closer, but we're way off, way up there, and he's way down here, and there's no temptation. We're so far above it in the fullness of God's expression that we reveal the defeat of his depression. No wonder that Luke 17.37 says, talking of the rapture and it says where the body is and that singular body where the body is the eagles plural gather together now that's an interesting verse the body is God's one new man where all true born again blood bought believers have entered into his death and his burial and have entered into his eagle resurrection and where does that eagle resurrection take us? Abiding, where do we make our nest? On a rock. Wherever there's death through the resurrection the eagle is right there to take you up. And, uh, and to have you abide on a rock. And of course in 1 Corinthians 10.4, that rock is Christ Jesus. In Exodus 17, that's where the river of water came out of when they needed uh, to drink. 
And in Exodus 33, God hid us in the cliffs of it. And we saw his back parts as he passed by. Now, where the body is, there the eagles gather together. That means where, the, where people become singular in the life of the body, all around them are the eagles with their life from above and they gather together in a corporate body who in Matthew 6.22 have a single eye and a single heart in Matthew 22.36. It isn't divided in Hosea 10.12. And right there with the singularity of a pure heart toward God and toward their fellow men, they begin to live with life from above and their prey is far below and their eyes see them way off and they're way above with total dominion, with total authority and the rod of the enemy can't reach where they're seated, can't reach where they're living, can't reach where they've ascended, can't reach what they're talking about, can't reach where they're thinking, can't reach where they're feeling, can't reach where, where they are and they've got to come down and, and not allow Christ to keep them up in order for the devil to make them experience his horizontal accusations and intimidations and attacks. Now, one to Psalm 78, 41 says they limited the Holy One of Israel. Limited Him. Limited God. In the Word of God, in Psalm 78 and verse 22b, they trusted not in His deliverance. They trusted not in His deliverance. Just think about that with me. They trusted not in His deliverance. Think of it. That's his own people. And in verse 29 of Psalm 78, he gave them their own desires. And in verse 32, and when all this, they still sinned. And all this, it says, they still sinned. And you know what verse 33 said? And their life was filled with trouble. 31 and 32, I'm sorry. Their life was filled with trouble. Think of it. That's one good way to have a troubled life. Because when God gives us our own desires, they will still not satisfy us at all. How many people have waited on God and sought God and got what they desired and consumed it upon themselves and you kept giving them more and you kept giving them more and you kept giving them more and when it was all said and done, their life was still filled with trouble. You gave them love, gave them joy, gave them peace, gave them grace, gave them patience, gave them meekness, gave them mercy, gave them... Uh, what you had in Christ, but when it's all said and done, they didn't receive it because they were after what they desired and their life was filled with trouble. And all this, they still sin as a practice. Just think of that tonight. And as you do think of it, I think you'll understand so beautifully what Colossians 3 is teaching. In Psalm 78, 8, they did not set their heart aright and their heart was not steadfast toward God. The 24th verse says that he gave them manna to eat and corn from heaven. Manna means the finished work, food before they were death and buried with Christ. And corn in Joshua 5.11, when, when the manna ceased and he changed it to a corn diet, it simply meant that now they themselves will be dead and buried in the Jordan River and live in the resurrection of the throne ministry. Manna was receiving the finished work, but corn was becoming the finished work in expression. And he gave them all that and they still 
limited the Holy One of Israel, some of them. Because their heart was not set aright. And I cannot tell you in 1976 how vital it's going to be to have your heart set aright in the body with authority and government and power and provision and unity and union and peace and joy and you're going to have to put on something because it's not going to come on naturally. Well, thank God. In this section tonight, there's three put-ons. And I want you to think about this. First, God has provided us everything we need to wear in every situation. But every single time, we have to put it on. Once we put it on, it'll do the work for us. It'll do its work. I mean, in Finland, it was cold. It was cold. Five hours of sunlight and freezing winds, and it was beautiful, but it was cold. And uh, you made sure you put on your coat. But once you put on your coat, it did the job. It really did. At least with me it did. And uh, once I put on my coat, I didn't have to say, coat, please protect me. It protected me. Now, every situation gives me a new opportunity to experience what I know in Jesus Christ or what I am in Adam. I don't think you got it, but that's okay. Every single situation in my life gives me an opportunity to experience what I know in Jesus Christ and be renewed in it in knowledge right then and there a hundred times a day or it will reveal what I am, what I have set my heart to be in Adam on purpose because of my own attitude toward Jesus Christ. Every situation will either be beautiful or reveal my rottenness. It will reveal that He is beautiful in Psalm 48 too or that I'm rotten and they can't see Him. In Isaiah 1.6. And think of that carefully with me. What do you think Paul meant when he said, I count all things but lost in Philippians 3.8 and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And then he said in verse 9 that I may be found in Him. It's so easy to give up everything I possess to God except my obsessions. Give up my possessions but not my obsessions. I'm obsessed with certain things since a child and I will not give up my natural, mental and emotional obsessions. But I will give up my possessions. So if a person gives up their possessions but not their obsessions, they live possessed by their obsessions. And wouldn't it be something to say, Lord, I'm not going to be like Ananias and Sapphira. It's all yours. And then tomorrow say, did you recognize what I gave? <laughs> Possessed by your obsessions. Instead of forgetting that, because it was given to God and taken away forever. I want you to understand what a gift is. A gift is giving something with nothing in return. When God gave me the gift of salvation, it was eternal redemption in Hebrews 9, 12. And it was, He doesn't, didn't expect me to do a thing except to receive the gift in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. When I give God a gift, even as He forgot my sins, 
I must forget that I gave it or it wasn't an eternal gift. It was a temporal loan. Now then, I want you to see how Satan wants us to be possessed with our obsessions because if he gets us to obsess or live in obsessions, it doesn't mean much what we've given of our possessions. He's still got the main thing that's involved in the army of God, us. Did you ever stop and think what a liberal is? I used to think of a liberal as someone that denies the virgin birth, and that's true. That He's certainly a liberal and denies the word of God. He's a liberal. But a liberal is a person that privately interprets the Bible the way it pleases them so they can have pleasure without a cross. And I like what a lanner once said, Bobby Oliver Doty's wife. She said when she went to a certain college, she did everything to defend her liberty in so much that she became in bondage to her liberty. And I know a lot of people who are, who are going to have to face God in bondage to their liberty and they think it's alright to be without a body, without a government, without an apostle, without a prophet, without a pastor, without anybody to oversee them and they do what's right in their own eyes and nobody in heaven can stop them. And furthermore, no one in heaven will stop them. But heaven will make them pay the consequences someday. If you don't think that people have to do that, then you explain to me what it means to suffer loss in 1 Corinthians 3.15. I would say that if somebody reigns over 20 cities and I could reign over 20 cities forever and lose it because of rebellion and stubbornness and greed and pride, then I've suffered a loss. Don't tell me that you don't care about rewards. I do. I don't think of them, but I certainly care about them. And if I didn't care about them, I'd be backslidden. If Paul cared about him, I'm going to. In 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, he did. He pressed toward the mark in Philippians 3, 14 for that prize. Now, in verse 10 of Colossians 3, this is what it says. And have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew nor circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all in all. What happens when a man puts on the new man and he's renewed in knowledge after God's own image? Right away, Christ is all in all. Not his house, not his friends, not his money, not his education, but Christ. Christ is all and all. Let me ask you an honest question. Do you honestly think that you have to live by faith for tomorrow? Or is your life so prepared in the order of the natural that it doesn't require any faith in the order of the supernatural. Oh, I know everybody has to have natural faith when you sit down in a chair. I'm not talking about that. I said the order of the supernatural. And the only thing that pleases God is give me this day my daily bread. The only thing that pleases God is when my life is reduced to nothing where it takes the faith and the promises of God to get through the day and get through the night and that's the only thing that pleases God. In Hebrews 11.6 and 2 Corinthians 5.7 Romans 1.17 says from faith to faith. Now, what does it mean? It means that Christ is all in all. I think that every one of us here will be standing before the judgment seat of Christ before a generation is over. Generation is 40 years. And every single one of us will give an account before that happens. Now we have the chance to have the character 
of Calvary, where we've lost everything pertaining to reputation. And we have the opportunity to live in the character of the eagle. The only bird that can look the sun right in the eyes and not get hurt. We can look the son of righteousness of Malachi 4.2 right in the eyes of his character and not get hurt. Anyone else will get blinded, but it, it makes us exactly like his image is a reflection of his light. We can look into the sun and go from glory to glory in 2 Corinthians 3.18 and not get our eyes injured because we're walking by faith in the light of his provision. All right, verse 12. And here it is. Put on. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Aren't you glad that you've been elected? Nobody knows who's going to win the election. That is, some people may, but uh, I've, I've had heard a lot of predictions and usually they're not good ones. You know, the thing I notice is a lot of people when somebody when the election's over they say I predicted that. And I never read it, you know. They tell you when it's over who who they predicted. That's some of the the freaks in the country, the spiritualists and all that. Um, but aren't you glad that you have been elected? Can you imagine how somebody feels the morning after they've been elected? I don't know. Today, I don't know how they would feel, but uh, I suppose they'd feel good. They've campaigned and they put out all this work across the country and come near. They almost got shot and maybe they did and, and they've done all of that and yet they won the election. Think of that. You have been elected. And Charles Spurgeon said, uh, he said, I know that I'm saved. The devil voted against me and God voted for me. And, and the Holy Spirit cast one vote and he said, I'm saved by that one vote. <laughs> now, the devil's vote doesn't count because he was beat at Calvary. The, uh, but thank God we have been elected. And we are God's elective offices, our elected offices in His army. Now, as God's elect, because we have been elected to be born again, we have been elected to reign with grace, we have been elected to be God's government, we have been elected to be God's expression on the earth, we have been elected to reveal an invisible God, we have been elected to, to pray victory over disease and sickness and incompatibilities toward the Master. We have been elected and given the keys of death and hell. In Revelation 1.17 through Matthew 16. And because we have been elected and we have won in the election of grace and we have won in the election of priesthood and God's kingdom on that throne because we have, now he said, in order to be good electoral representatives, I want you to put on something. It's not going to happen. You've got to put it on. And this is what I want you to put on. Holy and beloved, I want you to put on, the first thing is bowels of mercy. The second thing is kindness. The third thing is the humbleness of mind. The fourth thing is meekness. The fifth thing is long-suffering. The sixth thing, I want you to forbear one another and forgive one another if you have a quarrel. And isn't it beautiful? The seventh thing in verse 14 is charity. Seven things we're told to put on and that's God's perfect number. And once you put on those seven things, fifteen, the peace of God rules in your heart and you'll be thankful. And he said, okay, I want you to put it on the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6.11 but you must put it on. What is the difference between two Christians going to the same ministry hearing the same words and involved in the same principles of service? One puts on, the other doesn't. 
What is the difference between some people getting sick and some people staying well, what they put on? You see, in before God in Hebrews 3.13, we, we're all naked in before God. And because we're naked, we must put on God's clothes. We must put on God's character. We must put on God's attribute. The power within will not reveal the character without unless we put on something in our mind sealed by grace through faith. We must put it on. Why do some people get victory over liquor when a prayer is made and the others can't do it? When they're tempted, they put on Christ and He's all in all. Why do some people get victory over depression and somebody can't seem to do it? And you've got to pamper and baby and wait because that person does not put on Christ. You've got, listen, He saves you forever, but you've got to put Him on to enjoy His forever saving life. Now, for example, here comes temptation in one of those seven things. A tent temptation to live under the law. So you put on bowels of mercy. And bowels, you know what the bowels do. And you know what mercy will do. It will go into that area that would discharge the waste and discharge God's mercy in the waste tracks. And that's the first thing you need is mercy in the waste tracks. Are you getting that? Don't be so hard to li listen. Don't you understand that every day of your life, human waste must go from your body. Human waste spiritually, mentally, and emotionally because of who you are in Adam. But put on bowels of mercy and let the mercy fill the bowels and go out to reveal grace. Well, anybody could be kind after that. So you put on kindness. And uh, it's easy to be kind if God's given you mercy for the wasted things. Or you say, He was so merciful to me, I'm going to be kind to Charlie and Emily and Jessica and all the rest. Now, that makes you kind. And the third thing is you start getting humbleness of your mind. Why? You have received so much from God, it humiliated you mentally, not in depression, not in rejection. I said to somebody yesterday, on the phone, I said, and this is the first time I ever talked to him like this, I said, this year I want you to wise up. And I said to, I said to Bobby Olivadotti, they'll either resent themselves forever and, and get out of here or they'll start getting right. I said, you're proud and stubborn and hateful and you don't let the yay be yay from the pulpit and the nay be nay. You don't love your brethren. You don't lay down your life. You don't submit. Get right. You know what they said? It is about time, isn't it? <laughs> I was happy to hear the crying. I hope it wasn't crocodile tears. <laughs> it's the first time I ever talked to him that bad. And, and uh, you know, some people go out white as a ghost and others will stay and cry it out and get right. Why be a ghost when you can be, have a heavenly countenance? Well, anyway... Uh, the third thing was humbleness of mind. When we realize what we have in Jesus Christ and what He's given us, then it makes us humble in our thinking. A person that isn't humble has never received much for his wickedness. That is much grace. The fourth thing is meekness. Transferring your spiritual rights. Transferring your spiritual rights that you have on the throne. What does that mean? I have the right as a servant of God to pray that bad things will happen to my enemies. Do you know that? Sometimes I've been tempted. But uh, I have that right. And just between you and I, so do you. I have that right. David prayed those things. I have that right. But meekness will make me transfer it. I have a right sometimes, maybe. I'll speak for you now. I'll have, I have a right in a family argument to defend my rights as the head. Haven't had an argument for years and minutes and moments and years and days. But anyway, I have a right 
to, to do that. But what happens? I put on, I put it on now. It's something I've got to put on, transferring my rights. I have a right to say, I want you to listen to this. This is the truth. I lay my hand and don't you ever. I have that right, but I can sit back and say, let God judge between me and you. I know some people here tonight, I just looked at a very dear sister who was voted out of her church. I won't look at her again. She, <laughs> she was voted. Now, you know why she was voted? Because she got something from God and got blessed. She's a sweet, humble person that loves God with all of her heart and her husband loves God just exactly as much but when she got something that was called life they had a meeting and they vote would you believe it her husband helped vote no no <laughs> I will be teasing listen I want you to I don't know if it's true but anyway I want but I want you to see what happened but she loves those people. She's not bitter. She's not resentful. She loves them deeply. That's meekness. Transferring her spiritual right. What did David did before King Saul? When Saul tried to take his life three times, what would, what would we have revealed in that situation? <laughs> well, that's what the Bible tells me to do. <laughs> it says an eye... <laughs> <laughs> it says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He tried to get me three times. Obviously, God wants me to get him, you know. <laughs> you, know you get in the crowd, you get talking about these things, you always got the guy that comes up and I suppose I've been that guy sometimes myself and I imagine you have. <laughs> sometimes I know I've been that guy that has said it years ago, I hope. I don't know. But anyway, you have this... Uh, you have this, these people all saying what somebody's done. He says, boy, if they ever did that to me. Christian or no Christian, I'd put it to them. I won't speak to him for years. That'll fix him. What happens? They've got something to put on. And it's the character of an eagle. Way up there in the victim, way down here. We know everything he's doing, know everything's going on, can see it from afar off and behold it. And all we have to do is, we don't have to produce something, but put on something. Now, if we had to produce something, it would be impossible. But to put on something, mentally and emotionally, then that's another thing. We don't have to produce something. We have to put on something. And what we put on does its own producing, its own protecting, and its own expressing, and, it's, and it covers us. It's something we put on, not something we rationalize and produce. So we put on meekness. The wife nags and nags and nags and is hateful and mean and ugly and unkind and cruel and the husband puts on meekness puts on kindness puts on grace puts on charity puts on everything and you know when it's all said and done there's some still more things to put on for the next argument <laughs> because everything that he put on is inexhaustible and eternal and unchanging in the quality of its character Well, after meekness comes a good one. It's called long-suffering. I want you to see a verse I saw today. I have not noticed it for a long time. I'm going to have you turn to it. Second Peter, chapter 3. Verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, that's new heaven and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. That really got a hold of me. The long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Think of it. 
Now, my long suffering isn't salvation because I have my breaking points. You have your boiling points, I have my breaking points, put us together and we boil and break with each other. But, uh, the long suffering of the Lord is our salvation. What is salvation? He waited and waited for us to get right, for us to repent, for us to come and receive Him. He waited and waited and finally we said yes and His long suffering comes in to deliver us. The long suffering of our Lord is salvation. The goodness and long suffering of God leadeth us to repentance in Romans 2.4. The long suffering. So Jesus Christ says, Listen, I want you to put on long suffering. Not impatience, not anxiety, not a hasty spirit. In Isaiah 28, 16, He that believeth shall not make haste. Not an anxious spirit in Philippians 4, 5, be anxious for nothing. I don't want you to put it on. Anxiety produces tension. Hastiness produces fatigue. And a nervous tension. Long-suffering. Be long-suffering. Listen, it's taken us years to put our program together. We can't do it <laughs> with you overnight. <laughs> if you know the hours that go into everything that we finally have happen, the hours and years and months of considering and planning and praying and believing and obeying and walking and growing and knowing, it's hours. Don't be immature over something at 7 if it didn't happen at, at 7.30. The long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Now, put on long suffering. You see, I'm not naturally long suffering. Because I'm a go getter. And as soon as I can get it, the better I'll go again. So, but thank God when we learn together obedience in Hebrews 5.8 by the things that we suffer. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered and he was always sinless, of course. And we're not. But we can put on the character of his sinlessness in a situation. Every time something comes up, I'll have to experience something. I'll have to experience something I've always been like somewhere or something that he is now like and how can I experience what he's like by being renewed in something I've been taught in knowledge in the image of the one that created me and let Christ be all in all so put on long suffering the next thing is put on forgiveness because Christ forgave you put on forgiveness out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water and as it flows it will come in Put on forgiveness. Forgiveness is something you put on. You see, I'm, I may be confessed up to date, folks, totally walking in faith, but if I do not put on forgiveness when the situation demands it, a forgiveness that forgets in Ephesians 4.32, then the river can't flow. The life can't come in. The knowledge will stop the freshness of it, the power of it. And everything that I have will turn into the letter of the knowledge and I make the cross of Christ of none effect. In 1 Corinthians 1.17 That's why it's such a vital thing to let the north wind come and let the spices flow out in Song of Solomon. Chapter 4 And that's so vital because I must keep putting on and then I have what it takes for the storm, for the wind, for the trial and I reveal to those walking by sight what I'm wearing. If I'm wearing forgiveness that forgets, that's very obvious. If I'm wearing long-suffering, they'll see it. If I'm wearing meekness, they'll receive it. And if I'm wearing kindness, Oh, they'll know that. And if I'm wearing bowels of mercy, 
I won't, that means I will not be running myself down all the time because I put on the bowels of mercy inside of me. So in the wasted areas of my life, I'll put on God's mercy for my own foolishness, for my own failures, and for my own selfishness. And then let the mercy forgive me. And then what I put on will help me to live the way I'm supposed to for those that need me and are walking by sight. Here's two fellows that have not got along good. And they're brothers. And they were telling us two days ago their testimony. In fact, Hugh was telling us how his brother came to visit him. And he got right with God and how close they are since he got right with God. But you see, here's, here's the situation now where I can live in the logic and reality of truth and react in the honesty of truth. But now I can put on 1 Corinthians 13 and believe all things and hope all things and think no evil and endure all things. And I can do that and I'll have a love that never fails. I can put on charity, which is 1 Corinthians 13, or I can just be honest as a religious representative of my Adam's change from evil to good at the tree of knowledge. Will I put on love? If I do, I've got the bond of perfectness. And so this brother said, he went to his brother whom he had felt for years had wronged him. And he went to him and he said it was the strangest experience. He went by faith and still felt he'd wronged him. But when he got to where his house was, he immediately started weeping and he bowed down and said, my brother is a brother after the flesh. He said, he said, please forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And he wept. And the other brother said, but for what? It was my fault. And uh, they, they just embraced each other. And, lo- and he said, for 11 years, we were separated because of stubbornness and pride. But he said, I know what it is to go by faith before the fact and be the fact of love after you get there. So you do things by faith before the fact and then your life becomes the fact of love as the evidence of your faith toward those that need it. And the thing that happened was he put on charity. What difference does it make whose fault it was? Who cares? He's been. For- Let's say it wasn't his fault. He's been forgiven of all of his sins that he has committed, even if he didn't commit any against his brother. He's been forgiven of all those he has committed against others. So what's wrong with putting on charity as a bond of maturity? Because he has been forgiven, and so he just does what the nature that he has received from God in grace has done for him, and he puts it on and lets it become the nature that does it for others through his consent. So he puts on charity. I think this past week we saw a man in another state show us this as much as anyone we've ever seen. His wife was living in the past five years with seven or eight men in filthy, rotten, stinking sin. And he got this tremendous burden because she had come to the end of herself, drunk, no good, nobody you could, ugh, terrible. And so he, he fasted and prayed and got the liquid waves of unconditional love came all over him. And he's not an emotional man. He's very, very secure in his mental attitude toward life. And he went and told her that he, that he loved her and she's it's only three days now. I do not know what she'll do in the future. I'm not predicting. I've, I've, uh, I hope I know what she'll do. But I've been on in this long enough now to say, praise God, it's good today. <laughs> That's why I'm not going to tell the names right now. I'll let them tell it if she makes it. <laughs> not that she's on trial, but the point is uh, she's okay today. Praise God, she's doing nice tonight. Now, but he told her this, and she could not believe, she could not believe that he could stay all this time and be faithful and still come and she's lived like that. She could not believe it. She fell 
flat on her face and she wasn't drinking and she fell flat on her face and she repented after five years at least for the time being and responded to that amazing love. And they, they're back together tonight as a family. Now what did he do? He put on charity. He put on charity. Charity forgives. Charity forgets. Charity is kind. Charity suffer long, suffers long. Charity is patient. Charity believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things, and never fails. And that's what it means to put on Christ, who is all in all. You put on charity, which is a summary of everything you need for every situation, so you can express his experience instead of experiencing your own expression. And then finally, last night I had, I got all the kids together, New Year's night, and had devotions, and they all prayed and sang together as a family. And then I gave them a message, or a devotional rather, on charity. And I thought, as many times as they hear me preach, two sons going to Bible college of their own choice, I offered to send them any place in the world. But they said, God, let them to go there. I never even discussed it once with them, ever. And they chose to go. And I think it's great because it's the highest form of education in the world. Never once did we even discuss even the possibility. I will not do that. Of, uh, but we discussed everything else and then we prayed and God was going to lead them. And he led them and that's where he led them. But I thought, now I'm wondering tonight how they're going to respond again. And I looked and there they were, totally involved. One started, and it was just a building up devotional. One started weeping over the devotional. The other prayed a phenomenal prayer. They all prayed. But they responded. Beautiful. Why? Because charity doesn't fail. You put on charity and it doesn't fail. A person may fail to respond to it, but long-suffering says, I'll wait. And you see, charity gives me everything I need for every kind of a person. For example, if they're legalistic, I'll give them mercy. If they're resentful, I'll give them kindness. If they're incontinent, I'll give them God's grace. And if they're impatient, we'll give them long-suffering. If they don't forgive, we'll give them forgiveness. Charity Gives, is equipped to give you what you need while they live in sin. You won't love their sin. You'll hate it. You won't compromise with it. But you do have what it takes to reveal God, which is so opposite from them that it should make them hungry and warn Him. So put on charity. Okay? You ought to because you've been elected with it. You won the election by God's love. You're in office because of God's love. So why can't you put on what he gives you to wear? Who wants to wear the devil's clothing when they've got royal apparel? You know, uh, when, the, when the prodigal come home, one thing he got was his father's clothes. And if you abide in your father's house, you'll get special clothes from your father. You know, the elder brother had every single thing in that house and didn't enjoy it. He says, everything that I have, the father said to the elder brother, he said, everything I have in Luke 15 is yours. So why are you griping about what I gave the son? I think the worst thing in the world is to be an elder brother. <laughs> Sometimes I think one of the worst things to be an elder. But anyway, <laughs> but the worst thing in the world is to be an elder brother. Uh, okay. you um, An elder brother, home, criticizing the father's gifts to the prodigal son. It's about like the parable that Jesus told. Somebody worked just the last few hour and got just as much as the crowd that worked all day. Four 
way, people don't like it when people get something for nothing, do they? But listen, God gives gifts by grace. You can have it all tonight. If you haven't been living in it for ten years, tonight you can receive just as much as in one minute as we've had all of our ten years. And we hope you receive it. You'll go out just as rich, just as well dressed, just as much to put on as we have, and we've been in it for all these years. Listen, that's how good God is. That's what it means when it says He's no respecter of persons. He'll give you His gift free tonight, and if you're a Christian but you've lived carnally, He'll let you put, stop putting these things on as His elect starting tonight. Don't tell me that you don't have a capacity. Put it on, it'll give you the capacity. Don't say, I can't understand. Somebody said to me the other day, uh, it was a young girl, she, she was thinking of leaving and going to Florida because her father died. And I said, your dad, I called her in the office yesterday, New Year's Day, and I said, your father died? And she said, yes. I said, when? She said, nine years ago. <laughs> I, I thought it was this week and I was prepared to comfort her, but it was... <laughs> I said, well... I said, this is strange. The note says here you've got to go because your father died. I said, oh, no. And I started laughing and she looked so sad she was going to cry. I said, I don't mean you can't go home. I mean, I want you to do what God, uh, what God is leading you to do. And I don't want to, I don't want to regulate your mind. But I mean, is this really why you're going home because your father died or is there another reason? And she said, I can't understand it. I said, good, then it isn't because your dad died. I mean, <laughs> but um, she said, I don't, she said, I, I don't think I have the capacity that other people have here. And uh, I said, well, that's funny. I said, we all feel that way. We don't have a capacity for supernatural truth unless the supernatural God reveals it. I said, I, uh, I said, I want you to tell me some things about Christ. And so I asked her a few questions. She gave fabulous answers. I said, you know why you gave those answers? You put on Christ to answer me. You lived up to what you knew I wanted you to do. You put on what you knew. You were renewed in knowledge. Listen, don't tell me. I don't care who you are tonight. If you've had any exposure to God, He'll renew your mind in knowledge if you'll put it on. And don't look at self. Okay, and then finally, the peace of God will umpire in your heart in the one body by which you were called and be ye thankful. Now, what a beautiful thing it is uh, to have a peace which is the result of God's work of grace in our lives and to let that peace always rule. <laughs> Praise God, it's right. <laughs> Amen. Okay. I, I want you to see how that... <laughs> which one said that? It's all right. Praise the Lord. It was good. But in case the folks that buy the tape don't understand this, it just came behind me different. Well, anyway, it was right on. It was... <laughs> but, oh, boy, it sounded like a bass singer, you know, giving a recitation. But anyway, I, I want you to see that the peace of God may and can and will rule. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> That's right. The peace of God. You know, Christians, some of you folks that haven't been to many of our services, we have a, I don't, I'll say it again. I want to say it just for all you newcomers. I don't drink like you do. <laughs> I, um, I don't go to x-ray movies or any other movies like you do. I don't go dancing like you do. And I don't smoke like you do. And uh, uh, therefore, <laughs> the fun I have is with Jesus Christ preaching and teaching and witnessing and sharing and reading and praying and fellow. My fun comes out of heaven instead of other means like the bottle. Can you imagine preaching anywhere from 27 to 41 times a week and being sad and tense all through every message, acting just like there's a funeral service every moment? <laughs> Standing up straight and blue, up you go, down you go, here we go, there you go, singing the same old hymns with the same old right hand, the same old organist, 
the same old crowd, the same old everything. And can you imagine week after week, now we'll stand, now we'll sit down, now we'll pray, our Father. Who, and then, listen, and after week after week, the same old song and the same old uh, sermon. <laughs> can you imagine how boring I'd be in a mental institution? So the joy of the Lord is my strength. And we just have it the way it is. I mean, if it's if it's honestly funny without ever being frivolous or suggestive, never. But honestly funny, we laugh because that's the way God made us. Uh, We couldn't laugh if God hadn't given us a capacity. If he gave us a capacity, he must want us want it to do it. Want us to do it. I said want it to do it. He wants us. I'm not an it. I, uh, <laughs> he wants us to do it. Praise God. That came the yodel. Well, anyway, uh, I want you to notice with me that there's not a reason over in Second Peter back to Colossians 3. Now, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And that's precious. And then it says... To the which also you are called in one body. You've been called into one body. You can't get out of it no matter what you do. You can leave where it's located, but you can't leave what it is. The eagles will only gather where the body is. They won't gather where... Eagles will not gather where individuals is, but they'll, they'll gather where the body is, not where an individual is. I want you to notice that eagle speaks of everybody's portion in the throne life. And when the body gathers, everybody's portion in the throne life gathers where that single body is. Think of all the portions you miss when you stay away from where the body is. You, you lose all the portions of the different eagles. Hiding in rocks. Resting in dwelling places that have substance. Let the Word of God, Colossians 3.16, dwell in your hearts richly. With all wisdom, teaching one another, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and sing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all to the glory of God. This is this portion here says, listen, this is how I summarize it. How do we have character? And never mind about our reputation. We have character by putting on seven things. The result of it is peace. How do we keep it? By letting the word of God dwell in our hearts richly. Not in law, but in its richness. And how do we know it's richly? Because we sing with grace because of the words that we've heard. We can sing in grace. Don't you like this? Paul sang with a squeaky voice and the earth shook. No, that's the honest God's truth. He had a squeaky voice. 2 Corinthians 10.10 says his speech was contemptible. But Roman history says his voice was squeaky. And that was... Uh, one of his thorns in the flesh. That's, I want to give you another one to add to your list tonight. But anyway, so, Paul sang and Silas sang. And it was at midnight in Acts 16.25 and God sent an earthquake and released him from prison. Why? Because he sang with grace in his heart. <laughs> Ezra, Ezra 3.11 says, when they, I, I said it on some radio program today. I don't know if it was Boston or Portland. But uh, Ezra 3.11 tells about when the first part of the foundation of the new house was built, the temple in Jerusalem. It says, And they gathered together and assembled themselves together, and they sang to the Lord. Was that Boston or Portland? Good, I'll say it up here tonight then. All right. Now, notice it. I don't like to repeat. But notice it. It says they sang. The foundation is built and they came together and they sang. But notice what happened. That is the strangest thing I ever saw in my life. But it said there was confusion in the camp. I have a four-way Bible that somebody gave me quite a while ago. And one of the translations says, I don't remember what it is, but it's the second one over from the left, if you've got the translation. (laughs) And 
So, it says, and there was conflict, there was conflict in the camp. Now, I said, how can there be conflict? They finally got that foundation built, and they're singing together, and they're having a great time, and the writer Ezra says, but there's, there's problems going on. And the problems were amazing. There was a, some of the people, Israelites, started weeping because they remembered the first house that was destroyed. And here was a group shouting, Hallelujah! Glory to God! Praise you, Jesus! The foundation is laid! We're back! We're back home! The foundation... And oh, we lost the first one! We lost the first one! Oh, the first one! It reminds me the first house is gone! The first... And, and, and it said, honestly, you read Ezra 3, it says there was so much noise that they couldn't tell the di- uh, who was shouting for, for God's glory and who was weeping because they lost the first house. <laughs> Said you couldn't discern who's who, you know. Somebody's sh- praising God and weeping because something's happened. The other crowd's crying because it, the first one is destroyed. Somebody's mind was on yesterday when it was... When failure came and the rest of them was on today when God's victory was there. Do you know that's how people listen to messages? That's how they greet each other? Somebody is fresh, being renewed in knowledge in the character of putting on Christ. And others greet you and their mind is in a fog in London. The worst fog they had in 25 years. The worst fog they had in 25 years waited until I got there. (laughs) I thought they'd have icebergs in Finland, you know. Well, anyway, so the amazing thing was they couldn't tell which. And you meet somebody, meet somebody tonight, and somebody will be renewed in knowledge and somebody else will be in a fog. You know why? They're remembering when something bad happened. They're not renewed in knowledge. They're living in what their Adam life has experienced as their knowledge. It's terrible to live in what our Adam has experienced because no one Adams here has had it too good. We are... (laughs) We are either living in what our Adam's nature has experienced or the effects of it. Or we're living being renewed in knowledge and God's cause of a brand new happy life. And the difference is this. Will we put on Christ or will we let Adam continually put on his attitude toward the situation? <laughs> He doesn't even dare to say amen. They all said amen, went home. Uh, (laughs) Praise God. Okay, I'm going to close. And I want you to notice this. Whatsoever you do, do heartily is unto the Lord. That's Colossians 3.23. One of the things I like, I can't, please forgive me, because you're supposed to have that after tonight, but I can't stand anything being done that isn't heartily. Whatsoever you do, do heartily is unto the Lord. In other words, do it with all your might. Do you know something? Do you know some pastors will come in the body? We had a beautiful time with Pastor McDonald today. And some of these precious men of God are so precious. And we got a plan now where we're going in. Most of our citywide campaigns is going to be... Um, uh, development housing. Uh, we're going in and, and hit some Christians and just teach some Christians and teach them to teach. And maybe we can't do much in some of these development areas, but we can teach them to do it. And we're just going to have an ex- concentrated program on teaching Christians that want to be taught, that have no particular body, in all these housing areas that we can get in. We're going to get a contact and go from there to another contact and have them teach after we teach them. And we think, rather than demanding anything from them about coming out, we'll just carry the gospel to them and evangelize them and books and tapes and everything else and correspondence courses right in housing areas and do this instead of the citywide campaign 
Um, for the most part, excuse me, we'll have the citywide campaign, but not nearly as much. It'll be that this type of evangelism. Well, anyway, this is what we plan today. And uh, hit the Christians and do it with believers who don't, who are, you know, want teaching and who aren't really happy not getting teaching. But I was thinking about this word heartily. Whatsoever we do, do heartily. If I read the word, I want to do it heartily. If I'm going to pray, I want to do it heartily. If I'm going to go to sleep, I want to do it heartily. Uh, And uh, uh, whatsoever you do, do heartily as unto the Lord. And uh, do it with all your might, and not by might, nor by power, but by God's Spirit. So if a believer goes into everything and does it heartily, I think the Lord loves it, the angels like it, the Spirit is happy, the Father is happy. Other believers are happy. Just do it with all your might. Do it heartily as unto the Lord. Right? Do you know... Do you know a lot of records are broken because people do things heartily? I don't... In sports. Because they give that extra thing that they've got. It comes out of no man's land and the little guy breaks the record. Jumping, etc. But for Jesus Christ, so winning, do it heartily. The kids last night prayed, Lord, make me effective in so winning this year. Melody prayed, make me uh, a better singer in the Spirit of God this year. And uh, do it heartily. Do it heartily as unto the Lord. And let's do it heartily. Because doing it heartily is simply the summation of having God's heart because of His character. Would you bow your heads?